we are going to start book nine. We have done the book eight earlier last year during the vacation period. Now we can jump from book seven to book nine. I think we had taken for book seven uh, uh, how many eight months mm -hmm. roughly. Uh, <laughs> yeah, something like that, yeah, more than that, yeah, more than eight months, in fact, yeah, yeah. In fact, that is one of the longest books in Savitri, the book of yoga. And uh, that was a book which was uh, composed very late in the writing of Savitri. 46, 47 during that period, you see. Practically nothing existed before that, as far as Book of Yoga is concerned, you see. So in that we have essentially the latest yogic statements of Mother and Shemadu's realization as recorded in Savitri, you see. So if you want to see a kind of spiritual autobiography of them, then we can really trace it through those stages, you see. Book of Death, Book 8, was written in 1918 and it had remained more or less as it was. The first draft of Savitri, it contained book 8 and it was called at that time Canto 3, what we have got here, Canto 3. In fact, it is written by Shevendu, three Roman letters like that. Now, that Canto 3 was the Canto number of that draft. It does not mean that in the Book of Death, Shivendu would have added two more cantos when he would take it up for revision. It, the three was pertaining to the earlier draft of Savitri, you see. When uh, in November, mid-November 1950, just before Shivendu's withdrawal, he dictated three important passages in the Book of Fate, particularly the last 72 lines of the Book of Fate, which are put in the Queen's mouth, uh, in, in Arrow's mouth, answering Queen. Those 72 prophetic lines were dictated in the last stage. And when that was done, then Shevendu asked Nirod Bharan if there is something remaining in Savitri. And then the road button pointed out the book of death and the epilogue. About that he said, we shall see about them later on. We shall see about them later on. Now, it is subject to interpretations. What does that later on mean? Mother says, she even wanted to leave it as it was. That's all. But then there are many intriguing aspects in it. What do the three mean? Canto three, Book of Death, Canto three, three mean. One clever interpretation is we have in the first part the Book of the Traveler of the World, etc., 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 all that. Book 2 also. Now, first two cantos of the Book of Beginnings, the Symbol Dawn and the Issue, bring out the issue of creation. Satyavan must die is a statement made at the end of the first canto. And why, etc., etc., that issue is maintained, is mentioned in canto 2. Now, 
from that the rest is a kind of different material as far as the issue and the development of the story is concerned you can straight away jump from issue to the book of death <laughs> it is a kind of padding packing whatever you want to call it or developing they develop the story and all that thing. but in terms of the sequence of uh, development uh, book of uh, uh, sorry the same old on the issue death and then um, uh, uh, they fight the quarrel the battle with yama etc so that is the main theme of sabitri in fact so the rest is a kind of a packing or a padding <laughs> if you like to say you see huge pick padding well in a way of speaking of course and therefore from uh, canto 1 the symbol down canto 2 the issue canto 3 the book of death <laughs> so you can really justify the canto 3 for that kind of a thing you see the yogis are very uh, very puzzling people that way and they can do this kind of thing you see <laughs> now in the uh, okay let me first give uh, about this book 9 some uh, details we have here in this book uh, essentially two cantos canto 1 towards the black void and canto 2 the jury in the eternal night and the voice of the darkness in Canto one, we have got three sections: one thirty-four, section one thirty-five, section one thirty-six. And Canto two, we have only one long, long, long section: one thirty-seven. In section one thirty-four, there are twenty-three sentences and eighty-two lines. Section one thirty-five. Thirty-four sentences and one thirty-seven lines. Section one thirty-six, thirty-eight sentences and one fifty-two lines. Therefore, the total number of sentences in Canto One is ninety-five, and the total number of lines three hundred seventy-one. Three hundred seventy-one lines is the total number of lines in Canto One. In Canto Two, there are in all one forty-one sentences and four hundred eighty-one lines. So this is the longest Canto also in this book. Four hundred eighty-one lines, you see. So in all, therefore, we have got four hundred two lines, eight hundred two lines uh, in book nine. You see. Before we uh, uh, take this canto, you see, it starts. So was she left alone in the huge wood. So was she. so obviously it gives you connection with what had happened earlier and let us see what happened earlier in the previous canto to the end satavan was busy with his work he feels tremendous pain in his head and heart also body and he approaches savitri and tells her this is what i am suffering with but of course savitri knows that the moment of his death is arriving this is noon summer noon in the month of june in the northern part of india <laughs> so you can you can imagine the intensity of heat for the summer noon and his hard work you rise to some kind of a sun stroke Thing. you see there has to be a physical cause for death if he died doesn't mean anything there has he, he has taken a physical form there has to be a physical cause for death and the physical cause for death is the summer heat and his hard work in fact throughout savitri 
you will see that all these things are connected with some are known, some are known, some are known. That thing appears constantly in various descriptions of Savitri. So some are and known are connected with the death. See, the marriage of Satyavan and Savitri we have seen, it was some are known when high cupola of morning, see. And exactly one year after the marriage, he used to die. So again, it has to be summer noon. So the physical cause of death is the summer noon, or you can say perhaps sunstroke. You see, it is certainly not the question of he accidentally getting hit with his axe, because there is no wound, nothing is ever seen. It is also not that he, he was bitten by a snake at midday like that, you see. <laughs> so that also is the only cause, physical cause for death is therefore the summer noon, you see. Now, therefore, he, Satyavan tells to his uh, no, to Savitri, his face lost, and even as her pallid lips pressed his his face, you see, he answered, Savitri, Savitri, oh Savitri, lean down my soul and kiss me while I die. That is what he says. You see, kiss me while I die. So Savitri is kind of kissing him there. People say kissing him there would mean, you see, kiss me while I die. People say, clever people say that she was giving artificial breathing <laughs> to regenerate his, you see. But it is not so, you see. It's very clear, see. And even as her as her pallid lips press his, his pay, means she is she's responding to him. But he is not able to respond now at all to her, you see. Losing last sweetness of response, his cheek pressed down her golden arm. She shot his cheek pressed down her golden arm. That is, in a way, significant. We shall see what that means. His mouth still with her living mouth, as if she could persuade his soul back with her kiss. Then grew aware. They were no more alone. Somebody has come there in the prison. Something had come there, conscious, vast, and dire. That is the approach of death, of, uh, death, death, Yama. Near her, she felt a silent shade immense, chilling the noon with darkness for his back. You see, again, chilling the noon. You see, the mention of noon is put in that everywhere, you see, is there, you see. Chilling the noon. See, the intensity of summer noon that itself becomes cold in the presence of death. Darkness for his back, and awful hush had fallen upon the place. So, the distant meeting place had become the distant place for the future creation. There was no cry of birds, no voice of bees. No cry of birds, no voice of bees, because everything is chilled. Everything has become cold. Everything has become silent. So this is a kind of an elaboration of chilling. No cry or burst, no voice of bees, you see. A terror and an anguish fill the world. Now that is the effect of vast and dire presence which was there, you see. Vast and dire presence which was there. A terror and an anguish filled the world, as if annihilation's mystery had taken a sensible form. Although, poetically, it is said as if, yogically, it is so. Yes, annihilation's mystery had taken a sensible form. For the, in the language of poetry, it is as if. But yogically, it is actually so that annihilation's mystery had taken a sensible form. He's standing there now. A cosmic mind looked out on all from formidable eyes, contemning all with his unbearable gaze, and with immortal lips and a vast brow, he saw in his immense destroying thought all things and beings as a pitiful dream. So this is what he sees. You see, he sees everything. It's a pitiful dream. What is this creation? See, I mean, such, such, uh, 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 what shall I say, assessment of Yama about his creation, you see. But basically what is important is Yama or death, he is identified with cosmic mind.
it means that it is an operative power in the cosmic dimensions. It is but a cosmic mind. It is not some higher transcendental mind which is coming and operating here. It is some force, some power, some being, some shade or whatever you want to call it, operating in the dynamics of the cosmos. The highest level of the cosmos is seen. You know, continuing all with an unbearable gaze, with immortal, rejecting with calm disdain, nature's delight, the worldless meaning of his deep regard, voicing the unreality of things and life that would be forever, but never was, and its brief and vain recurrence without seal, as if from a silence without form or name, the shadow of a remote and caring God doomed to his not illusory universe, cancelling the show of idea and act in time and his imitation of eternity. So this is the characterization of this dire shadow which is standing there in front of Savitri now. Savitri is feeling that thing there already present. And therefore, Savitri knows that she knew that visible death was standing there and Satyavan had passed from her embrace. Now, it's been okay to talk and ask some questions. Yes. Normally, when one dies, Yama doesn't come, he sends a messenger to take the soul away, isn't it? No, I'm not getting exactly yeah. what it is. Say, for example, if I'm dying, Yama is not going to come personally to take my soul away. God of death won't come. Maybe a messenger of him comes and takes the soul away. No, this is Savitri Singh, not mm -hmm. Satyavan. Mm -hmm. This is what is showed here is what Savitri is feeling, what Savitri is perceiving. Satyavan has now lost all his uh, uh, perceptions. He is no more there now. He has passed. In fact, he says, you know, had passed. It's already clear. So it is not Satyavan. It is Savitri now who is being described. Yeah, but Yama normally come down to earth and take the soul of the he, he, is, he is coming at the moment. He is coming here at the stage. She knew that visible death was standing there. Now the important thing is, in fact, this is what I was going to tell. The yeah. emphasis is on knew. He doesn't say, the poet does not say, she saw. Yes, she feels. She feels. She, no, no. I mean, she knows. You see, because the, she was, uh, she has a foreknowledge that it is going to happen. And the way Satyavan is responding, he is not responding to her kiss and all that kind of a thing. She knew that the moment has arrived. The moment has arrived. It is, it is Savitri who knows that, you see. In fact, that is what I was going to explain also. And he says, she knew that visible death. Now, she has not really yet seen, but she knows that, yes, he is now standing there in front. As if he is now physically, visibly present there, you see was standing there and Satyavan. See, again, this does not really, strictly speaking, does not strictly, I mean, does not really convey the fact that he is dead. It is Savitri's assessment, Savitri's perception, Savitri's knowledge or whatever you call it, which is now interpreted as his death. But of course, the fact also, you see, when he says, had passed from her embrace, it means that, yes, she is no, now, he is no more now there, you see. Now, this, you see, uh, okay, let's go further. Now, this one, you link up with the opening line. So was she left alone in the huge wood. She was left alone. What does that mean? It means that Satyavan is no more there. Satyavan is no more there. Alone, as far as human life is concerned. She is not really alone because Yama, death is standing there. But as far as human life is concerned, he, she is alone there now in the entire forest. So was she left alone in the huge wood 
that's the physical surrounding. Okay. Surrounded by a dim, unthinking world, her husband's corpse on her forsaken breast. Her husband's corpse. Now here he makes it clear that he is no more there now. He is no more there, you see. Forsaken breast. She has given up all hopes now. See, nothing can happen, you see. Now, <clears throat> there are a couple of things here uh, which uh, we might do first before we proceed further. Let us see some of the paintings connected with this scene. This is Hutas painting. She is uh, is still working hard in the forest, chopping the wood or whatever you want to call it. And he feels severe pain in his head. He approaches Savitri and uh, says, look, there is enormous pain in my in the head and all that thing. In fact, the Mahabharata description says, as if arrows are piercing into my brain constantly from all the sides. A severe pang is there. I feel a severe pang in my brain. As if arrows are piercing into my brain. So it is really the sunstroke, you see. Arrows are piercing in that sense. And you can see the Clive, the plight of Satyavan here now in Buddha's painting. Okay, before that, yeah, okay, yeah. And then she says, no, lean down my soul and kiss me while I die. This is what Satyavan is requesting to her. Well, I would say, these are the most wonderful things that can happen. At the moment of death, it is that thing which really helps him. See, your last wish is something which carries you forward, you see, in that sense. He cried out in a clinging, last despair, Savitri, Savitri, oh, Savitri. This is one of the most beautiful lines, absolutely simple, just same word, Savitri, Oz, Savitri, Savitri, Oz, Savitri. Perfect pentametric line, you see. There are hardly any lines of that kind in the entire English literature with such simplicity bringing such force. In uh, Shakespeare, you have got a line where he repeats the word never, 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 never five times, you see. <laughs> see. But here, the repetition of Savitri, you see, if you utter the name of Savitri in your last breath, that will save you completely. That will save you completely, you see. He has that power, you see. Kiss me when I die. What is you want, you see? So there's one way that means he's calling his soul, he's telling that my soul. Pardon me? No soul. No, it's no. And my soul. Savitri is her soul, exactly. Ah, that's right. Yeah. That's Savitri is my soul. Me, uh, Lean down yeah, my soul, soul. Yes. and kiss me while I die. You see. He has yeah. identified himself totally with her, you see. Yeah. That is true. You see, here the feet is sa we. Long shot. Three sa, short long. Then three o, short short. Then, sorry, uh, sa v one foot, second foot, v three, third foot, short short. O sa, fourth foot, long long. And again, e three, short short. See, that's the medical. Uh, Scansion of the line, see. Lean down my soul and kiss me when I die. Now you remember that, you see, such identity is there see, with Savitri, you see. Yeah. Lean down and kiss me while I die. Now here, you see Satyavan in the lap of Savitri. Here, she is leaning down, you see, in the lap, you see. And then we have here,
the opening of the new canto, see, Savitri now different Savitri altogether. Satyavan is there in, a, uh, uh, in her lap, you see. So was she left alone in the huge wood, surrounded by a dim, unthinking worm, her husband's cows on her forsaken breast. Now, there is a little problem uh, in these descriptions. Her husband's cows on her forsaken breast. Is it on her breast or in her lap? <coughs> Pardon me? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. No, no. Uh, the, you can't. Uh, it it doesn't matter. <laughs> no, but uh, <laughs> the pictures also show that he is in her lap. But there is not on her breast. There is a image where her breast is actually. Touching, yeah, but then uh, she, but basically he is in her lap, lap yes. in her lap, not on her breast. But here it says. He just said exactly that's what I'm saying. This is actually hard. Whatever you see, but I'm talking about now <laughs> the poetic description. You see, I'm talking purely from that angle. See, let's go back again here. You see. His cheek pressed down her golden arm. You see, not on her breast, you see, <laughs> not on the breast. She sought his mouth still with a living mouth, as if she could persuade his soul back with a kiss, then grew aware they were no more alone. Something had come there. Near she felt a siren she demanded, killing the noon in the Nopolis. Etc. We will see this thing a little more in detail, but uh, let us move on forward. <coughs> the pictures definitely show. Yeah, now, this is after his, now he is dead now, so it is in her lap very clearly. There is a previous picture. Breast is actually touching his, his forehead. If you go a little bit backward, there is. A, I saw that. You saw it. Yeah, her breast is actually. Uh, no, but here it's very clear. She she is on uh, uh, on, on her, her lap. Yeah, no, not on her breast. Seen. Yeah. Yeah. No. See, in fact, the earlier pictures also we have seen. Now there she is leaning down. Yeah, but now her breast is on his head. Yeah, it's on his head. Yeah. She's cushioning. Now she is cushioning, yeah. But then uh, he is not resting on her breast no, like that. Exactly. In that case, she has to lean down. Yeah, he is not, you see, yeah. Uh, she so cannot lean down otherwise. Right. His arm is too, she is leaning on her arm. She, she is very close to her breast here. I don't know. I have to still resolve for myself. We will we'll see some of the we we'll see some of the descriptions. Yeah. See, here is very absolutely clear. You see, lean at all. You see, but that is how he is lying down in that lap first. Lean down, my soul will happen after that. Lean down will happen after this. You see. <laughs> for me. No, no, no. You see, we are trying to see the. <coughs> uh, see, this is straightforward. This is no problem at all about this one. You see, so these few pictures. <laughs> and <coughs> when Satyavan, <coughs> when Satyavan is speaking to Savitri, I mean, he is asking, "Lean down, my soul." This is the position now. Is perfect. Why is her breath? And now this is happening. Huh? Why is her breast forsaken? Why so? No, whether it is a, no, my, my uh, 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 difficulty is, maybe my personal uh, difficulty is, whether it is the lap or in the best. Oh. 
the text says breast. The text says breast, you see. Well, of course, uh, we can also argue by saying that <coughs> Satyavan is telling to Savitri, let me lie down on your lap. Let him say whatever, but what is actually happening? <laughs> you see. Now, I have made a compilation of the descriptions pertaining to breast. You see, this is a very significant description. 112.51. Carrying the worst creature on her lonely breast. On her lonely breast. This is what Narad is telling in the Book of Fate. Carrying the human hope in a heart, left soul, etc. Then again, here you have got a dire expectancy knocked at her breast. 115.10. This we can understand as a good poetic description. Savitri is about to begin her yoga. She is not getting any clue how to proceed. She is now weighing various pros and cons. Do this, do that, what, how to approach and that kind of a thing. But therefore, all the while in her breast, in her heart, a dire expectancy, dire, the death of Satyavan. That expectancy is there all the while in her breast, you see. She wails from her. And bears a human breast, the world and fate. In the same passage, how Savitri's mother, sorry, Savitri's mother-in-law is saying things, you see. Or, you see again, waking at morn, her lips endlessly clung to his, that is, book 7, canto 1, you see. Unwilling ever to separate again or lose that honeyed drain of lingering joy, unwilling to lose his body from her breast. From her breast, you see. The warm, inadequate sign that love must use. Too well she loved to speak a fateful word. That is again the same canto. She is keeping the knowledge entirely to herself. Nobody in the forest knows that on this particular day, Satyavan is to die. She alone knows that thing. Too well she loved to speak a fateful word and lay her burden on his happy head. She pressed the outsurging grief back into her breast. Everything she is holding back, you see, to dwell within silent and hell alone. Well, let us skip some of these things and move forward. Yeah. The ancient mother clutched a child to her breast. This is what we have seen uh, in Canto 7 last time. Savitri would have merged into the unknowable and disappeared from this creation altogether. But she cannot go. She has a work to do here. So the ancient mother is holding her back and holding to her breast. So everything is important here. Everything has to be held here. Pressing her close in her evening arm. Perhaps she bore made conscious in her breast a miraculous nahil. She is holding in her breast the entire nirvanic state, nahil, stands for nothing now, except God, nothing, 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 in that sense. Origin of our soul. So, this is the definition. What is the origin of our souls? Nahil. We come from, from that soul. See, again, here, Savitri is approaching her mother-in-law 
on the day of Satyavan's death. She wants to get permission from her to accompany him to the forest. And therefore, she spoke, but with guarded lips and tranquil face. She is not disclosing what is going to happen at all. Guarded lips and tranquil face. As some stray word or some betraying look should let pass into the mother's unknowing breast. This is important again, you see. It's not her mind, her soul. Slaying all happiness and need to live, etc., etc. Et right? Now, Satyavan says, you see, this is important again. She came to him in silent anguish and class, and he cried to her, Savitri, a pang cleaves from my head and breast, as if the axe were piercing it and not the living branch. It is piercing his breast again. Her husband's cause on her forsaken breast. This is what we have been seeing now. And then she says here further, calmly she laid upon the forest soil the dead who still repose upon her breast. <laughs> For me? No, that is what we are seeing all, you see. I am going... <laughs> See, he, he is very clear. I mean, he, he says, repose upon her breast, you see, and go to turn away, etc., etc. And then, again, but still in its low niche of temple strength, motionless, her flame, bright spirit, mute, erect, burned like a torch fire from a windowed room, pointing again the darkness, somber breast, darkness, somber breast, everywhere that is important. Not left breast, breast. Let's move on. Yeah. Loss in the giddy row 156.11. Now, this is toward the end of the uh, Canto 11, third book 11. Satyavan and Savitri are coming back after Savitri getting the broom from the Supreme, and they're tumbling down, falling down like a leaf. Lost in the giddy proneness that speed whirl, sinking, overcome, she disappeared like a leaf spinning from the tree of heaven in broad unconsciousness as in a pool. So the leaf is falling into the pool. In that way, a hospitable softness drew her in into a wonder of miraculous depths. Above her closed a darkness of great wing, and she was buried in a mother's breast. Mother Earth, buried in a mother's breast. What I think is, this, this has connotations, this has significance. He is using this thing breast repeatedly in different contexts. In fact, we had to see in the whole of Savitri, in what nuance, with what nuances the word breast is used in different places. This breast has something very rich in it, not only just warmth, intimacy, love, affection, but something much deeper than that, as if there are some kind of occult things present in it, and it is that occult which is now coming into play at every moment here and there, you see. She was buried in a mother's breast. Lain on earth, mother's calm, inconscient breast. Calm, inconscient breast. She's coming down. She saw the green clad branches lean above, guarding her sleep with her enchanted life, and overhead a blue wing ecstasy flutter from bow to bow with high pitched call. That is how, well, this is Mrs. Sisley later on again. And then later on, Eva she held on the paradise of her. Ever she held on the paradise of her breast, her lover. <laughs> her lover, you see. Ever she held the paradise of her lover. Charmed into a fathomless sleep, lay like an infant spirit unaware, lulled on the verge of two consenting worlds. And Satyavan, when Satyavan now gets life back, here 
he asked Sabitri, what has happened? Where was I? Where are you going? You are following me all the day. Has thou not taken my heart to treasure it in the secure environment of thy breast? Okay. Are you not holding all the while my heart in your breast this evening? He wants touch Savitri replies to Satyavan. He wants touch fulfills, but cancels not our earth. Our bodies need each other in the same last. Still in our breast, repeat heavenly secret rhythm. Our human heart is passionately close. Our human heart is passionately close. And then finally, she closed her arms about his breast and head as if to keep him on her bosom worn forever through the journey for the years. Satyavan is awake and she is keeping her arms about him. Let us see the picture of that. One consenting thought moved every breast. See, Savitri is narrating, Raja Satyavan uh, is narrating what had happened to the daytime and people around there are asking, and then one consenting thought moved every breast. Everybody is now listening to them. And what is happening in their breast? Not here, not here, here, not in the heart, but here. Very close, intimate, warm. See. What gleaming marvel of the earth or sky. That is Savitri's breast, a gleaming marvel. Gleaming marvel on earth or sky. Stand silently by human such a one to mark a brilliant in the dusk of eve. So the eve is there, but she is burning there like a sun in the day. And that is the marvel, gleaming marvel. That is such, that is what is seen now in every press, you see. Now, uh, let us see, now, <coughs> what happens in the end when Satyavan awakes? But the breast is synonym to heart and psychic breast. Huh. He's using breast, he means the psychic breast is the soul, soul, the soul yeah. and the psychic being and the heart. Do you wonder if it's sure right. they use the word psychic being, yeah. psychic in, 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 in something? See, here now, to the end, when Satyavan comes back to life, the fellow is in her lap. <laughs> It is in her lap, no? Yeah, wrong. It's not true. <laughs> yeah. He, 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 he is definitely maybe, in her maybe lap. Maybe yeah. you see he's taking it from the, the Puranic story. Mm. The Puranic story. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. Like now, uh, I will, I will, I yeah. So. No, whatever it is, we are going by this so text. We are going by this text. You see, we are going by this I text. I think so, she has conceived the whole idea. Yeah, well, Puranic so. The Puranic story. Now, of course, he is awake. And he is now lying on the on the ground, so for and Savitri is looking at him, etc., etc. This is from here. See. Now, let me. So this breast, four second breast, is not that insignificant. You see. <laughs> uh, you see, during my recent visit uh, in Genova, I had given a talk on. Uh, Savitri is the poetry of immortality in the University of Genova. And uh, they had made huge big publicity everywhere in the newspapers, uh, in the canteens, in the cafeteria, in the streets. They had put a lot of posters. So this is the poster. <laughs> so this, this talk was sponsored by uh, Genova University, then by you know, two other organizations in collaboration with the uh, Indian Consulate in Milano. So all the three <laughs> at, <together>. Yeah. <laughs> it had come in newspapers, it had come uh, on the website. So th th there is, there is uh, something to be resolved about this uh, aspect, lap or breast. I, uh, I am not going to leave it uh, as it is. And there are some references about lap, but uh, uh, let us take the relevant ones. Now, Satyavan very clearly says 133.29 in the in that canto. 
Avai, let me lay my head upon thy lap, and guard me with thy hands from evil fate. Perhaps because thou touchest, death may pass. Upon thy lap, head upon thy lap. Now, my argument here is: this is Satyavan. What is saying? What actually happened does not mean that that has happened. Still, it needs a little bit of <laughs> checking various aspects of it. Now, woman later on, when Savitri will see the next canto later on, woman die husband suffers. Savitri is following Yama, and his body is still there. Now, although Satyavan has passed away, still. The connection of the spirit with the body is not gone. Is not gone, and therefore Yama says, "Madam, you please go back home and attend to the funeral rites of your husband. He is suffering. Thy husband suffers." He says, "Drew back her Savitri drew back her hands so that class his body still." See, obviously, I mean now Savitri understands the significance of what Yama is telling her that yes. He is still suffering there because his vital links are still there with the body. You see, so she understands that, and then where and then drew back her heart's force that class his body still where from her lap and nounced on the smooth grass softly it lay. <laughs> she moved from the lap to the grass. Huh? So was it lap or breast? Oh. Huh? Yeah. yeah, body still where from her lap and now is on the smooth grass. Well, she has laid it down now from the lap below. See. So maybe he fell on her breast and she was holding him and kissed him. I'm seeing it from a different angle, no? yeah. practically as a couple. She kissed him as. He wanted, and then he was on this. We, 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 we need to, we need to rest. clean up many of these uh, points. You see, at least. <laughs> no, practically, that's how it would be. Now, back to breast. No, no, kiss, kiss, and then the breast, and then the lap, and then yeah. the breast. So it's yeah. going slowly. Or yeah. yeah, but then uh, no, but the, he says, "Let me lie in your lap." Then uh, he's <laughs> taking your breast. Then later on, what happens? See? Maybe to so we'll have to we'll have to see all those connections. You yeah, see, we'll have to see that. we'll have to see all these connections. See? At the moment, I am just simply pointing it out. You see, <laughs> yes. No, 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 Husband's calves on her forsaken breast. What is forsaken? Yeah, concept. Yeah. Concept. Yeah. So for, but it is still on her breast there. Forsaken. Not forsaken. Her, he, her, her breast means now she has lost hope. She is helpless. She cannot do anything. Ah, lost hope. Ah, ah. Forsaken. Forsaken is for Savitri. You see. And he very clearly says corps now. You see, so this line is a really a bit of a puzzling kind of a line. You see, <laughs> her husband's corps on a false second breast. But uh, mythically, it's a very beautiful line. Her husband's corps, I am, I am, on her, short, short. Creek. For say, I am, and breast. Again, I am. So you have got two ams. Creek. Again, two ams. That is the metrical balance of the whole thing. Now, in this book, book nine, <laughs> uh, we are talking of the differences between this edition and the revised edition, nineteen ninety-three edition. Now, uh, in yeah, 
Many of them are for, for, for a minor nature. Many of them are of a minor nature. You see, for instance, here, we have got void in our copy. Here it is void with the full stop. Then silence thought is a comma. There's no comma here, etc., etc., like that. So in the first section, 134, what we are saying, there are 12 divisions in all. In the next section, there are 17 differences between the, the first edition and the last edition. You see, for instance, here, O sleeper dreaming of divinity, O sleeper, comma, dreaming of divinity. Many of them are of a binary nature. You see here I say, apart her, apart her spirit face. Both are possible, but I don't know what's the basis. No. Here, the difference is in the beginning. The present and past into the timeless lapse, what we have got here. And the revised, it is simply present and past into the timeless lapse. This D is missing in the revised edition. Yes. No, no, but uh, this part uh, is not uh, essentially dictated. This particular one, there are there are some drafts of this in awesome. seven rules handwriting. Also. So we don't know what is what, you see. But when he dictated, uh, he would have said not all dictated. Just yeah, no. No, no, but even then, the, if it is a dictated line, what is the basis of uh, removing the? Yeah. The basis, of? basis of removing yeah. the? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> you see, I mean, so those things have remained uh, uh, un, unknown, undisclosed. See, the, the, we, I can't really say in this particular case, no. basically. Uh, it is likely that in some old version, which was there earlier, he might have put the, or so the is not the present and past. Maybe somebody has copied or whatever, I don't know, can't say anything. In fact, I will not make any comment on that, you see. <laughs> you see, now there's this thing, Privilege of mind without comma, privilege of mind with comma here. And in the advice period of time. Now that can change the sense, that can change a comma does change the sense of the whole sentence, you see. We don't know, we can't say anything at all, you see. But anyway, there are uh, in this section 40 revisions in the third section of the The total number of revisions in this canto is 83. Uh, I will not say exactly the revision, the differences between the revised edition and the original edition, 83 differences. But uh, this is something important, what we are beginning with, the first sentence, what we have, no, well, it's not there now. She measured, you see, for the, our opening sentence is here. Her husband's scars on her forsaken breast. Then she measured not. Not. In the revised edition, there is an additional line here. At the beginning of the sentence, there is an additional line. In her vast silent spirit, motionless, she measured not. Can't say anything, you see. <laughs> Basically, it is very likely that that line was missed. You see, this is a line which cannot be invented by the editors. That is certain. It was missed somewhere and then they had restored it perhaps, you see. In her vast silent spirit, motionless, she measured not her loss. That is perfectly understandable, see. But the very structure of the line, I mean, it's very clear that it is a Savitri line. The meter, the rhythm, the whole uh, the way of expression, etc., is definitely a Savitri line. 
maybe somewhere it got missed and now they have restored it it's very really likely then again, in the same way this particular line was missed uh, in the first edition my will to is a law my strength take god between these two lines she is arguing with death and this line is also perhaps missed in the same manner so we have got in that sense these two plausible additional lines in the revised edition which are absent is there no it's not there no these are present only in the revised edition these two lines yeah yeah you don't have that you know you no it's not there it's not there no i checked that yeah this line is uh, added in the 1993 edition only you see so was she left alone in the huge wood surrounded by a dim and thinking world her husband's cause on a forsaken place now you see poetry is very simple there but the charm the power of poetry is that it is creating simultaneously that whole atmosphere the solemnity the depth the whole thing kind of occupied by pervasive death you see you can see the whole rhythm so was she left alone in the huge wood surrounded by a dim and thinking world her husband's call on a forsaken breast it creates at once it's not only the picture the whole atmosphere gets automatically created in front of you she measured not her loss with help is thought now savitri has to rise up to the occasion the moment of truth has come for savitri and she cannot just weep and cry and forget about what has happened you see she she measured not her loss with help so you see again he says it is already a loss it is already a corpse he has already passed away from her embrace you see nor rent with tears in a marble seals of pain so she not to weep and cry and she rose not yet to face the dreadful god so she is still in that calm quiet pose poised there she rose not yet to face the dreadful god over her the body she loved her soul leaned out over the body she loved her soul leaned out savitri savitri o oh savitri lean down and kiss me while i die savitri soul is leaning down on her body in a gray stillness without stir or voice as if in her mind had died with such as if her mind had died with such a one every sensation every measure of thought idea conception everything has disappeared with her her mind has become dead now so she but still so the mind is not there now but still the human heart in her beat on obviously so the mind is dead obviously this is preparation for the occult action of savitri she has to it's not by mind by thought by argument is it present but by bring out the occult force she has to deal with the circumstance that has arisen in front of her but still the human heart in her beat on aware still of his being near to her closely she clasped to her the mute lifeless form see again he is very clearly saying lifeless form see life in here he also had died with such a one very consistently we will see so the starting with the corpse here all the things are very consistent died with such a one lifeless form as though to guard the oneness they had been the oneness they had been satyavan and savitri had been always there and it is to guard that oneness she is now becoming aware to keep the spirit still within the frame so this is the psychological state of savitri she is already a yogini but now the yogini is arising to the truth of the moment 
she has to step into action. And then suddenly what happened? Then suddenly there came on her the change. Savitri is no more human Savitri now. It is some other Savitri who is going to take possession of the entire sequence. Yeah, because the mind died. Yeah, her mind has brought, heart is going on all right, but now some other person is there. See, he said, he said as if her mind had died. <laughs> no, it's, it's mind, it's not brain at all. And that apart, it is mind. It is as if. Imagine the mother was talking that she reached a state where she, her mind stopped and her psychic yeah. being took over. Yeah. Uh, and the chakras become, you know, conscious. No, but in the case of mother, in the agenda, she of course sent away the mind. Yeah. It is never the question of mind dying. Not dying. Here, here. <laughs> yeah. 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 Please, sorry, you have done your job. Now I don't need any more. Let me do my work with the physical. So that there is no interference from mental levels into the working of the body. But there again, it, it is not died, you see. No. It is sent away. It is sent away. So in case she wants it, she can always get it back, you see. Died means you can't get it back in there, you see. But here, he is very, very, very careful also. He says, as if. He is very careful also, you see. Yeah. That is the kind of a precision which is there in Savitri. A precision which even a mathematical description cannot provide you. That poetry can be so precise. This is one good example of it. You see. But still, the human heart, etc. And keep the spirit. Then suddenly, there came on her the change which in tremendous moments of our lives can overtake some time the human soul and hold it up towards its luminous source. Yes. Now, the yogi is very generous to say that tremendous moments of our lives. <laughs> See, our life. See, tremendous moment, I don't know whether it really comes uh, really in our eyes. It, it is true, because Mother said that you can feel the psychic movement when very... Yeah, but that is, that, is, that is true only for those whose psychic health develop fully. That is true only for them who are doing pakka sadhana. <laughs> it is for them, in the moment of crisis, the moment of change, moment of... Yeah. Then it really rises up. You have to have a long... Savitri has done yoga. She, we had done that book for eight, nine months. <laughs> but in the physical so, sense, we are doing the rest of our lives, so we put himself on our level in a way. Yeah, well, it is possible it, if it can happen if we are really prepared for that kind of a thing. We have prepared our life for that tremendous moment. Have we prepared ourselves for that tremendous moment? It may arrive. You see, it passes off generally, in most cases. Can overtake some time the human soul and hold it up toward the luminous soul. How many of us can really see in that moment of crisis the luminous soul? The veil is torn, the thinker is no more, only the spirit sees and all is known. So that is the miracle. The way is torn, thinker is no more, the spirit sees, all is known. That is a miracle in the case of the tremendous moment, when we have prepared ourselves for that tremendous moment. In other words, we can really see the light of what is going to happen then. We can get the proper guidance then to the future. Then a calm power seated above our brows is seen. Now this is what happens, you see. When that moment has arrived, you see above our brow a calm power. You see, he says capital power, the divine power itself coming here. Seated above our brow is seen, unshaken by our thoughts and deeds, a stillness where the voices of the world imbibe 
it moves in nature, looks on life, it, that power. It shapes immutably, it's passing, and again that power. It shapes immutably, it's passing. It is that power now which takes into calculation whatever we've done of what is going to happen later on. Passing ends. It is that power alone, that power which is seated above our brows. This Adnaya Chakra has opened up, the power is entering, and then it can see this, this Drishti has come into operation. It moves looks on life, it says immutably, is passing and untouched and tranquil amid error and tears. Error and tears of passion and mind, you see, of life and mind. And majorless above our striving will. So error corresponding to mind, tears corresponding to vital will corresponding to the body actions. His gaze controls the turbulent world of things. To mate with the glory it sees, the glory which sees above, beyond. It, so it prepares itself to meet that glory. The spirit grows. The voice of life is tuned to infinite sound. The voice of life is tuned to infinite sound. What a line this one is. Its vibration itself is so powerful, no? See the different lines and suddenly you get a different kind of a uh, expression here. The voice of life is tuned to infinite sound. As if it is coming from one end of infinity, moving, 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 and going to the other end of infinity, you see. The voice of life is tuned to infinite sound. This is what should happen, you see. The moments on great wings of lightning come and godlike thoughts separate the mind of earth. So this was this is the description of what happened in that tremendous moment. This is what is going to happen in that tremendous moment, you see. Into the soul's splendor and intensity, a crescent of miraculous birth is tossed, whose horn of mystery flows in a bright void as into a heaven of strength and silence. Thought is ravished. All this living mortal clay is sealed and is a swift and fiery flood of touches shade by harmonies unseen. A new sight comes, new voices in its form, a body with a music with a cause. Immortal yearnings without name leap down. Last purings of Godhead seeking run and wave upon a fusion field to form a high and lonely ecstasy of will. This in a moment's depth was born in her. So that moment for Savitri, that tremendous moment of Savitri has arrived and all that the tremendous moment can do, it is in that moment Savitri is newborn. She is no more now old Savitri, human Savitri certainly not. Even Savitri who has done yoga, she is now more than that. That yoga which she has done, that soul's force, that divine force which she has housed in her soul. It has, that soul now just to come into operation, into action. That is the new birth. Yes, it is there. That divine force is there. But now it has to come into action, into play. And it is that which now is bringing a new birth to Savitri's. Divine Savitri in action. That is the new birth of Savitri now. Isn't it? Uh, void is void and void is void. Black void. But here the bright void. Bright? Bright void. Why? Just uh, this one. Yeah. floats in a bright void. Yeah, yeah. See, I. I the void is not black. Yeah. Usually, void is black. The white white is black. Is black. Right, yeah. Now, <laughs> here, this whole sentence is a marvel of awful poetry.
occult images, occult symbolism, they are all packed in this one particular single sentence. A crescent of miraculous birth. See, that is, in fact, this is what I was going to say also. Into the soul's splendor and intensity, a crescent of miraculous birth. This is Savitri's new birth now is talking about. And that new birth is like a crescent tossed into the sky. What is a crescent, you see? Whose horn of mystery flows in a bright void. The whole night sky is bright and the moon's crescent is shining in that. Yes. Now, in fact, we'll see some, some of these things in more detail. This is a very important statement. Therefore, I quickly ran through and you can see the combination. In fact, the super surrealist poetry. <laughs> <laughs> super surrealism, you see, basically, if you want to call it that. You see. How the Yogic poetry can be so dense in its images and its implications. This is one of the most powerful examples. Into the soul's splendor and intensity, soul splendor and intensity that corresponds with bright. In the sky, there is nothing else except this one now. The birth will take place there, you see. A crescent of miraculous birth is taught. Now, this is a birth which cannot be accounted, which cannot be even guessed, imagined, impossible. It's a miraculous birth. How it happens? That is the magic of the tremendous moment. How the tremendous moment is going to work? That is not disclosed. It cannot be disclosed also. The whole, whole thing is the magic of tremendous moment. The entire description, all these uh, 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 10, 12 lines, sentences, they are the description of that tremendous moment, you see. In the tremendous moment, our lives change suddenly. Our, he is very generous to include us also <laughs> in what Savitri is experiencing. But this is meant, our means, basically it means for yogis who had done real good intense sadhana, tapasya. A crescent. Now, crescent moon and the horn of the moon is a very familiar image in surrealist poetry. It's not uncommon. It's not totally new also. But the way in which Yavindu has put here is something different. It brings the occult charge into full action here. If you see the surrealism of the uh, early 20th century, you see all those images very common. Surrealism includes crescent moon, you see. Is it true? <laughs> now, what is a crescent? Two circles of unequal diameters touching at one point and the remaining port forms a crescent. There is one circle like that, another circle like this. And the portion between these two, that is the crescent. Now the crescent can be left-handed, it can be right-handed also. The crescent which is there on Shiva's head is pointing to the right, to our right. <laughs> now, uh, I have some descriptions about this crescent. <laughs> In art and symbolism, a crescent is generally the shape produced when a circular disc has a segment of another circle removed from its edge. So that what remains is a shape enclosed by two circular arcs or different diameters which intersect at two points, <laughs> etc., etc. Well, basically this is one circle, the other circle, and what remains is the crescent. You see. In astronomy, a crescent is the shape of a of the lit side of the spherical body that appears to be less than half illuminated by the sun, as seen by the viewer. 
mathematically assuming the terminator lies this it is not going to do i will pass on this discussion to you <laughs> the word present is derived etymologically from the present participle of the latin verb preser to grow waxing moon that is present thus meaning waxing or increasing and so was originally applied to the form of the waxing moon duna crescens the english word is now commonly used to refer to either of the either the waxing or waning state yes. from the moon crescent full moon same as from full moon crescent no moon in the technical language blazoning used in heraldry the word in crescent refers to the crescent shape which is hard to the left so in crescent the hard to the left to the right decrescent so she was in addition to the left so this is left so she was the uh, uh, crescent uh, decrescent No, it's it is a description. So this is decrescent. This is in percent. Pardon me. I'm just thinking this number is I just can do. Is it for that? No, it's scientists. And then there are some other descriptions, etc. In the Byzantine Empire, and I will. Another note. Ah, yeah. 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 It is. It is a uh, decrescent. Uh, no, no. Sorry, it is pointing upward. To oh. no pointing at the right. So decrescent. Yeah. Decrescent. Uh, like she was. On his head. <laughs> she was. She uh, was. Crescent is on this side. No. Yeah. No. Uh, uh, on. On this side. On this side. Yeah. On this. Yeah. Yeah. but uh, as i told you this crescent moon is a uh, very powerful symbolism uh, in the recent modern poetry mm. the occult aspect is very rich in it and shivendu has uh, the crescent a crescent or miraculous birth it is tossed the miraculous birth suddenly How it happened? This guy, horn, whose horn of mystery floats in a bright void. So the whole thing is an empty sky, but bright sky still. Into heaven no strength. Yeah. Now, of course, here symbolically it is connected with what is Savitri seeing, experiencing. Void. and you see again the poetry is a very complex poetry in this line seven lines but very complex kind of a thing it will need one full hour <laughs> we will see later on perhaps and he says as if into a heaven of strength and silence the uh, occult aspect is there the luminous mysticism is there and at the same time there is a shift of image from image of image from image see he talks of horn then all this living mortal clay is seized and is swift and fiery flood see fiery flood harmony so there is a kind of a combination of so many uh, metaphors coming into one single description you see and it is that which makes it richer also and but here you see most of the line Into a soul's splendor and intensity, 
This is practically end stop line. A crescent of miraculous birth is tossed. Okay. Then whose horn of history flows in a bright void. Yes, there is a pause there. As into a heaven of strength and silence. Pause. Then thought is ravished. There is enjama. Line is overflowing. Here, the line is overflowing into this one. And silence, thought is ravished. Suddenly, the whole technique has changed, you see. The line, in earlier cases, it is stopping at the end. But now, suddenly, the line is overflowing also, you see. Because it is preparing for the fiery flood. <laughs> see. What's harmonious means? The meaning of harmonious is here. Yeah. He is rabid. All this living mortal clay he sees and in a swift and fiery flood of touches shaped by harmonist unseen. So this is the miracle at the tremendous moment performed by the unseen harmonist. What is harmonist? Unseen because he, he no, wouldn't know. What is harmonist? The meaning of harmonist. Harmony. Everything is in relationship, has a concordance, has connection with each other. They are not discordant. All the things are happening. Is it a harmonium player? No, no. A harmonist. He is the player of harmony. Oh, okay. So he is a player of harmony. Harmonist, not harmony. Harmonist. And you see, it is a capital H. The supreme harmonist. Yeah. Everything is in relation. Everything is kind of worked out in relationship with each other. And because of that, <laughs> because of that, a new sight comes. Because of that, a new voice arrives. Because of that, music of the gods, uh, that harmony is going again with music harmonies, you see. And because of all these things happen, and therefore all these in a moment depths were born in her. So whatever was happening now in the case of Savitri, is because of this unseen harmonist. Mm -hmm. Does he talk about yeah. supramental in that sense? Is it such a big change? There, there is a power working behind all what is yeah, going yeah. to happen there. Yeah, but on what level? Uh, supramental, I don't know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Harmonist means he is some su supreme power. Yeah. Yeah. You, see, you see, a calm power is related again with that harmonist. And is of course unseen. <laughs>